This is BBC Radio 4. The fate of Northern California's ancient redwood forests provides the backdrop and motivation for Alan Dean's exploration of a controversial life and a bitter battle in the dark woods, told in the words of those who were there. Don't mourn, organise. The Judy Barry story. Who was Judy Barry and who bombed her? Uh, those are two very significant and not easily answered questions. This is the largest forest rally in the history of the U.S. Forest Protection Movement. I became a revolutionary, and at least in theory. I tried to put it in practice throughout my life. Our struggle to save these forests has been a trail of tears. Misguided. Misguided and no science background. Just uh, almost religious belief. Mother Earth, Earth first. We're coming, and you can't stop us. Anarchy. Just anarchy. Anything to disrupt. If you don't like our demands, if you think our demands are too radical, well, I don't care how much power you think you've got. Over environmentalism, liberal environmentalism, communism, and terrorism are all the same. And no matter who or how powerful these corporate criminals think they are, they're not in charge. The earth comes first. She made a lot of enemies. Through a car being driven by two Earth First activists on an open street. As she was being wheeled, some regular street officer asked her, Who did this to you? While she thought she was dying, she managed to get out the one word that summed it all up. She said, Timber. Have you seen her broken body? Or the spirit you can't feel? This is the fiery tale about little Judy Barry and the giant redwoods of Northern California. Judy called herself a revolutionary ecologist, two words that could either inspire devotion or hatred. In 1990, someone even tried to blow her up. When I sought her out nearly ten years ago, she was an icon of the environmental movement and their fight to save the forests. Now she's something of a martyr, for Judy would die of cancer at the age of 47. The fight for the tree still rages. Ever since the redwoods were discovered by the New World in the 1850s, they've been a unique symbol of American majesty and power. Used to build a frontier nation, and even more precious as their numbers dwindled. In the late 20th century, they became the battleground of the timber wars, which continue to this day. As much of a battle over different beliefs as it is over the trees. And in the thick of it all was Judy Barry, fast-talking, quick-thinking, fiddle-playing, agitator and orator a transplanted East Coaster who now lived far away from any city in a wooden house with no electricity to plug my tape recorder into. Were those batteries recyclable, she asked, as I sat down to hear a story. OK. All right. Judy, do you mind if I sort of take you back and to ask you how you became politicised? Where did it come from? Um, I became politicised in college at the University of Maryland in the Vietnam War. And my first serious political activities were riots, getting tear gassed and things like that. And we had political study groups. I started reading Marxist stuff and anarchist stuff and all. I started reading that in my college classes, but I found it was more fun to be out in the riots than it was to be in class. And I dropped out of school one step ahead of flunking out. And when the war ended, the movement evaporated, at least little by little. But some of us, including myself, were forever changed by that. I mean, we really believed that there was going to be a revolution, and I haven't changed that. I, I don't think the system can be reformed. Capitalism needs to be overthrown. As to how that will come about, I'm not so sure at this point, but um, I'm sure trying. I began working, just working at jobs, and I was reading about labor history. Then I worked at a um, grocery store, which was unionized, and I helped lead a strike of 17,000 grocery clerks in three states. And we were, to my great naive shock, smashed by the union bureaucrats who collaborated with the company against the rank-and-file movement. That was a real eye-opener for me. So a couple years later, I got another union job at the post office, and I started over, and I incorporated all of the lessons I had learned in the retail clerk struggle, which we had lost. We just did direct action at the point of production, and we developed real power in the factory. It was very strange, and the unions, the existing sellout unions, just kind of fell from power in the face of this real movement that we had organized side by side. I mean, we did all kinds of workplace sabotage, and we were very successful. It was the most successful thing 
anything I had ever done in my political career. By now, I was no longer just a follower. By now, I was a leader. And why did you move to California? To get married. Um, I thought I had married my comrade lover, which is the dream of every revolutionary, right? But um, as soon as we began to have children, he wanted to have a nice middle class life and not, um, you know, take the kind of risks that I still wanted to take. Barry would soon find plenty of risks and a new radicalism in Northern California. Once you've been organizing labor on the East Coast, the Redwoods have become home to a thriving counterculture war veterans and war protesters who had gone back to the land to live free, grow their own and make a new world. The seeds of a burgeoning environmental movement, expanding alongside, but never with, the traditional values of the frontiersmen, farmers and lumberjacks who had harvested the land and the trees for generations. Jerry Philbrick. They were definitely uh, from another planet, we noticed them for sure. And then little by little they started forming little activist groups you know that were complaining about the logging we were too busy working and didn't pay much attention to what was going on until they had a, a pretty good grip on things and, and then that's when all the action started it was no accident that earth first were formed in 1980 the same year ronald reagan came to power Locally based and loose-knit, Earth First enemies with increasingly powerful corporations and all those who dared hack away at the sanctified redwoods. Once there had been two million acres of the trees that could reach 15 feet in diameter and 20 stories in height, now a fraction remains. For Earth First and many environmentalists, these are the untouchable old growth, ancient or cathedral forests. For loggers and those who own the land, the trees were an economic way of life. Wooden gold, not wooden gods, were thousands of dollars a tree, however old they were. No compromise indeed, and no common ground. And then along came Barry. I got involved with Earth First not because I was a you know, tree-hugging environmentalist, but because I was working as a carpenter. And I was making yuppie houses out of old-growth redwood. And it was the most beautiful wood I had ever seen. It was 20-foot-long boards with a tiny grain and no knots. And I asked the bookkeeper, is this old-growth redwood? And he said, oh, yeah, this tree was a 1,000 years old. And I went, whoa, you know, what are we doing this for? Should this house even exist? And I was attracted to Earth First because they were the only ones that were actually putting their bodies in between the chainsaws and the trees. And direct action at the point of production, I already knew to be effective from the labor movement. No compromise in defense of Mother Earth. Earth First. Earth First, especially back then, described itself as a, a revivalist movement for the environment. Uh, I sometimes say I'm from the Church of Fundamental Ecology. We, we take nature literally. Don't you know there's gonna come a time when the table will be turned? Musician Daryl Cherney left the concrete canyons of New York looking for a new life and a new cause. I was running for Congress. Yeah, running for Congress? <laughs> yes. Well, you didn't know that one, huh? <laughs> we had what we call a timber Democrat in Northern California, even and especially the Democrats support the lumber industry. So I entered the Democratic Party primary. This is the day before uh, computers, and so I was laying out my brochure by hand. Judy started to ask me questions about my run for Congress, like, oh, where's your uh, position on labor organizing in your brochure? And I said, I didn't have any. Well, where's your, what's your position on economics? And I said, I don't know anything about economics. And where's your position on feminism? And I didn't have one of those either. And she said, how the hell can you run for Congress and not have a position on any of those things? What kind of fool are you? And I immediately fell in love with her. And... Judy and I realized pretty much immediately that we were going to work together. Cutting down the forest, hauling it away from the lovely lumber truck at the break of day. That's the baby redwoods hit that forest floor, running through your chipper to make your way for board. There's only one solution to what's going on, and that is no corporate logging. Corporate they did what? Our American Constitution allows them to do, which is freedom of speech. Local politician and farmer, Marilyn Butcher, frequently crossed swords in the council chamber with a guitar and fiddle playing duo of Barry and Cherney. 
but not taking away other people's constitutional rights, which was freedom of making a living, freedom of cutting their trees if they needed to, and freedom of a big business doing business under proper government regulations. I live in this area where you can feel that the earth is alive. I couldn't feel that when I lived back east. You can feel it being killed, but the idea that nature doesn't exist to serve humans, that humans have to find a way to live in nature without destroying nature, that was a hole in my ideology. As a straight social issues leftist from the east, from the you know industrial factory movement, I had never even considered that. We actually set an agenda for the rest of the environmental movement to protect old growth forests as a broad sweeping issue. Thank you. Yeah, just sure. to cover that. Absolutely. Now, the trees are 300 feet. They're 15, 20 feet across. They're 1,500 to 2,000 years old. We do not recognize their claim to own these trees. They're ripping out the lungs of the planet, and no human being has the right to do that. Yeah. I, okay, I don't know what to call them. I'm going to have to call them wackos. Not the honest-to-goodness environmentalists like I am or other farmers are or regular citizens are, but the wackos. They would go into the forest driving great big huge spikes into the trees to stop the loggers. When they sawed into a tree, they would hit a spike, damage their equipment, or worse, damage themselves Physically, these environmentalists thought, as Mark said, anything justifies the end. One of the things that attracted me to Earth First at the very beginning was the whole ethic of monkey wrenching, or shall I say destroying equipment in defense of the ecology. It drew media attention. It woke up the timber industry into paying attention to environmentalists in a way they had never paid attention before. Now, it doesn't mean that we practiced monkey wrenching. We did not. There was no tree spiking that Earth First engaged in in Northern California. There was no destruction of machinery that Earth First engaged in. But singing songs about it, talking about it on the radio or in the newspapers, people had a certain healthy fear. Worrying enough, perhaps, to attract the attention of the men in black, San Francisco's FBI Bureau was legendary among leftists for its use of COINTELPRO, aggressive destabilization campaigns to infiltrate and neutralize radical movements. And by the late 1980s, there weren't too many high-profile targets left. Environmental journalist David Helvog. It's hard to imagine now, but uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, domestic terrorism was not a major problem because they, they cleaned up the right-wing order that had been carrying out kidnappings and assassinations in the 80s. They'd rolled up the uh, Puerto Rican nationalist bombers, and they were not yet aware of the growing right-wing militias. So they had a $26 million domestic terrorism budget. Industry was complaining about Earth First. And so the kind of vandalism that if carried out by teenagers would essentially get the local cops uh, rousting the kids uh, because it was done in the name of forest protection was seen as an attack on the establishment. With skeins and skeins of brightly colored yarn and wove them in and out and in and out of the trees. Well, you can't cut that down with a chainsaw. That just wraps around your chainsaw. And you can't cut it with a logger's axe because it bounces back. There's only one way to take yarn out of the woods, and that's with a scissors. So it's a very unmacho kind of way of getting apart. They weren't really the people would come up and challenge you physically, but they would do things that would allow them to block a road or tie themselves to a gate or sit in trees, and then the law would come along and wouldn't do much about it other than take them away, and they'd be right back the next day. So we're blockading a Simpson Lumber Mill in Samoa, California. A truck is pulling in, and unexpected to anybody, this young man jumps in front of the truck, slides with his body onto the concrete and sticks himself underneath the tire of the truck. The truck comes to a screeching halt, and the truck driver just starts screaming out the window of his truck. Judy Barry jumps up on the running board, and the guy says, Get a job, you hit me, I'm tired of my paycheck having to pay for your welfare. And Judy Barry says, BS. Because I worked as a carpenter with old growth redwood myself. I was a single mother working at an industrial job in this rural area. I have a job. I have to support two children, and I don't want my paycheck having to pay your welfare after they lay you off after they've cut and run. 
So there. And this was something pretty unheard of, because one of the ways the corporations have been able to stay in power in this environmental struggle, have been able to win it hands down in most places, is by pitting the workers who are not benefiting from this against the environmentalists. And actually, the two should be on the same side. So I began not only working to save the trees, but I began building alliances with the loggers. But what common ground could there possibly be between macho independent loggers opposed to unionization and tree sitting radicals? The answer perhaps lay in who now owned the trees and the land. Many of the traditional old logging firms have been bought out by massive corporations. Wholesale clear cutting, removing great swathes of the once infinite forests, was dramatically increasing. Would there be a forest left to cut for their children? Unfortunately, uh, once the large corporations got a good grip on this area, they kept us all working, you know, the ones that could stay with it. And uh, it took a while for us to realize that these guys were, you know, really going through this country pretty fast. And if they couldn't agree on the fate of the trees, then Barry could find common cause on the shop floor. I began to use my experience as a union organizer to help represent these mostly non-union timber workers against their bosses in workplace issues that had nothing to do with the environment. To organize timber workers into a labor union, unbelievable. Daryl, this sounds folksy. This sounds utopian. Was it really like this, though? Oh, my goodness. I mean, if Judy could organize... 15 or 20 lumber workers into a labor union, there's about 1,500 of them who probably wanted to kill her. Judy Barry, get out and go back to where you come from. We know everything. You won't get a second warning. Ominous, anonymous and threatening, the hate mail for Barry, Cherney and the other activists was getting hard to ignore. Betty Ball was then director of the local environmental center. Judy took her collection of death threats and I accompanied her to meet with the local sheriff's department and explained to them what was going on. Judy showed them the death threats and <laughs> their response was, the response from the sheriff was, we don't have the manpower to investigate. If you turn up dead, then we'll investigate. We were having what was called National Tree Sit Week, various timber demonstrations every day. On my way to the final demonstration of the week, a log truck rammed my car from behind. I sailed to the air, hit another car, my car was accordioned, and me and my children and my friend and her children were all ended up in the hospital. It turned out that this was the very same log truck and driver that we had blockaded less than 24 hours before. People that were willing to kill us. And that was a very strong revelation to me. Well, we knew that we were being watched. We knew that we were being monitored. There were too many strange things happening on our phone lines. During this period, how is it for a woman with two kids to live through this? It was terrifying. I had two choices. I could either shut up and leave town, both of them, neither one by themselves would be enough, or I had to stand up to it. The death threats that we were receiving put an enormous strain on our relationship. How should we protect ourselves? How do we react to this death threat? Should we give it credence and put out a press release, or shouldn't we, and who's going to write it, and, you know these kind of conversations that probably most people don't have, we were having. What we decided to do was to call for something that we called Redwood Summer, based on the idea of Mississippi Freedom Summer, which was in the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s. And we saw a parallel situation in that we were a rural area where locally there was a stranglehold by the local authorities and the timber companies in this case. But we felt that we had an issue that morally most people in the United States would support us if they knew. They wouldn't support either the slaughter of these ancient trees or the harassment and violence against the activists. So we called for students and others from all over the country to come in and engage in nonviolent civil disobedience to protect ourselves with numbers and to protect ourselves by getting the information outside of the area so that with the eyes of the nation on us, we didn't think they'd be able to get away with this. It got picked up by the national press, and it began to appear that we really were going to pull this off. Well, I don't care how much power you think you've got with your suits and ties in there. Our demands may be radical, but the demands of the earth are truly non-negotiable. And no matter who or how powerful these corporate criminals think they are, they're not in charge. The earth comes first.
explosion tore through a car being driven by two Earth First activists on an Oakland street today. Both are alive and have been hospitalized. I heard a crack, and then my whole head started to ring like a sitar in my head, like... Earth First activist Judy Berry was seriously hurt with facial injuries and a pelvic fracture. Daryl Cherney suffered lacerated eyes and ears. Then I heard somebody scream out, it's a bomb, there was a bomb, and then it all made sense that someone had tried to kill us. Both are at Highland Hospital. Berry has just come out of exploratory surgery. I can't even describe how horrible it was. It was hidden under my car seat. I now know that it was triggered by a motion device. It was triggered by a ball bearing that had to roll to connect two contact points. It was completely hidden under my seat, and it blew right through my seat. It broke my back, and it nearly killed me. And I could barely see. You know, I had a patch on one eye, and my other eye was pretty much shut in sympathy with the other one. And these guys, you know, I could vaguely recognize in business suits, showed up, and they said to me, Who are you? And I said, Well, my name's Daryl Cherney. Who are you? And instead of telling me who they were, they reached into their little you know, inside jacket pockets and they flapped open their badges to show me. And I realized that anybody stupid enough to show their identity to a blind man had to be the FBI. Police apparently think that the two may have been transporting explosives. They declared that we were not the victims of an assassination attempt, but that we were the perpetrators. And, of course, they didn't tell anybody about the motion device. And they said that the bomb was in the back seat of the car being transported by us to use in an ecotage or, you know, industrial sabotage action. May have been transporting explosives. They said, look, look. We can tell who this is, so why don't you just confess, make it easy on all of us, and get it over with. This wasn't a mistake of judgment. This was a deliberate lie by the FBI. In 1991, a year after the bombing, Judy Barry and Daryl Cherney filed suit against the FBI and the Oakland police for false arrest, illegal search and seizure, interference with their right to free expression in violation of their First and Fourth Amendment rights. They were taking on the might of the government. It's almost impossible to sue the FBI because they have something called qualified immunity. I think it's called sovereign immunity in England. And because they are an agent of the state, even if they falsely arrest you, as long as it was a mistake, an honest mistake made in the course of duty, they're not liable to it. They can shoot you in the back, and they're not liable for it unless you can prove that they did it knowingly and maliciously. So it's a very high standard, and very few cases are able to stay in court. The case was hoped up. It was phony as a $3 bill from the beginning, and that was pretty obvious. Leading Barry and Cherney's legal team was the experienced civil rights lawyer, Dennis Cunningham. For Cunningham and many others... The bombing wasn't just an act of local vengeance designed to silence someone making a lot of noise on behalf of the trees. The stakes were much higher than that. There was at that time in the state of California pending for the November ballot in 1990 a referendum type vote on a brand new state law that would govern logging practices and severely restrict the ability of these companies to exploit the forest the way they were and the way they have since this initiative was called forest forever it was very complicated it was very well thought out and it was substantially ahead in the polls at the time of the bombing and then the publicity against it after the bombing was no earth first initiative oh this is too radical oh these are this is a bombers initiative i mean it was smeared and it lost by a point and a half in the election we've had a halfway scientific estimate that in the time between the bombing and the trial in 2002, the companies probably took in three to three and a half billion dollars in revenue that they wouldn't have been able to get. The Justice Department is who runs the court. The Justice Department is who runs the FBI. The Justice Department arrested me and framed me, and now the Justice Department gets to decide whether I'm right or wrong. So I have no faith in the courts. If I win, I'll be shocked. And even though we've won Every single motion so far, if I win, I'll still be shocked. That's what Judy felt as we sat together in a wooden shack back in 1995, the long summer evening wearing on, her daughters playing outside in the woods. She never let on how much pain she still must have been in from the explosion that had ripped through her body, planted by a bomber or bombers who remain out there somewhere. Whenever I looked at Judy, I knew that I couldn't make her better. I couldn't heal her. There was something in this world that I was not able to do, and that was to put Judy Barry back together again. There was just always this sad component to life after that, until the day she died. 
Okay, welcome to the Punch and Judy Show. This is your host, Judy Berry. Well, last week, uh, of course, I didn't show up at my show, and I um, dropped the devastating news on you all, at least devastating to me, that I've learned that I have cancer, and I've dropped out of a lot of the things that I normally do. You know, the trees wouldn't let me go last summer, but this fall, the trees let me go. You know, this isn't even the worst thing that's ever happened to me. If the FBI pulled up and arrested me for having cancer, then it might be the worst thing that's ever happened to me. Well, I was driving out of Oakland on a tour for Redwood Summer. When a bomb went off inside my car, it was a major bummer. They blamed me for the bomb. Barry died in March 1997. Over a thousand people attended a funeral. Before her death, Typically, she'd insisted that her obituaries list her occupation as a revolutionary. And she urged her friends to remember the last words of union organizer and martyr, Joe Hill, just before his execution in 1915. Don't mourn, organize. The FBI stole my fiddle, and I want my fiddle back. Barry's last victories were both posthumous. Years of campaigning by her and others finally secured a few thousand acres of towering redwoods, but at a price that would have disturbed her. The corporation that owned the land received hundreds of millions of taxpayers' dollars for what amounts to a tree museum, an island of ancient trees surrounded by continued cutting. The more emphatic victory, even though it went largely unnoticed by the world's press in the wake of 9-11, was a triumphal verdict and a multi-million dollar award in the historic lawsuit against the government. Dennis Cunningham. It felt good, you know. We had an extraordinary jury. They were out deliberating for 17 days after the trial. The damages broke down. It was $4.4 million, about half and half as between the FBI and the Oakland cops. 80% of all of the award was for the First Amendment violations. In other words, we're confirming the uh, central claim that we made that what they had done was done on purpose in order to smear and disrupt this movement. And nobody ever got any money against the FBI for any kind of claim. Settlements have come through, but verdicts are rare as hen's teeth. So nobody ever got a verdict against them like this. And if you go down to the woods today in the state of California, You'll find not one, but two commemorative days dedicated to Judy Barry. Don't Mourn, Organize was presented by Alan Dean and produced by Mark Berman.